All right, next up we'll be hearing from Dr. Craig Thompson. He's a landscape wildlife ecologist with the U.S. Forest Service and Conservation Biology Institute in Corvallis, Oregon. He completed his PhD in wildlife ecology right here at Utah State University. His background includes a blend of landscape and wildlife ecology with a focus on large-scale habitat change and the interaction between predators, competitors, and prey. And today he will be uh, speaking about some of his ongoing work that involves restoring forest functionality. Let's give it up for Dr. Thompson. Thanks. <clears throat> All right, thank you. Does this work okay? All right. <clears throat> um, as Ryan indicated, um, I am a wildlife biologist, so when I think of restoring forests, um, I see it through the lens of wildlife, particularly carnivores. Um, I received my PhD here at Utah State back, I think, 2005, um, and prior to that and since then, um, for about 20, 22 years, I've been working with threatened and endangered carnivores kind of all over the western states. Um, a lot of that work has focused on uh, reconciling their habitat needs with uh, fire and fuel management. Um, and so when I speak of restoring forests, I'm talking about functional and resi resilient habitat. So whatever I speak about, remember that that's kind of the lens that I'm looking through. Um, and over this time, I've been involved in probably three or four large-scale habitat restoration and ecological restoration efforts. Um, I have kind of developed some opinions about these over the years, and so what I'm hoping to do today is kind of share those opinions with you. <clears throat> and before I get into that, though, I'm going to do kind of similar to what Dr. Brunson did. I'm going to start with my kind of final conclusion and my opinion, and then I'm going to spend the rest of the time kind of explaining why. I feel that way. Um, and I'm going to start with an example here. This is an overview of the Southern Sierras in California. Kind of shows Yosemite National Park, Sierra National Forest. I spent close to 12 years doing uh, forest carnivore research in this area for the Forest Service. Um, and this is one example of some of the stuff that we were doing. It, I did a lot of fisher research there. If anybody's familiar with fishers, they've been on and off the endangered species candidate list in the West States since something about 1990. And this is just an image of some fuel reduction projects that we did in a little area called Blue Canyon of the Sierra National Forest. These were part of probably a 2,000 acre fuel reduction um, effort overall. We did, and, and I was deeply involved in trying to develop these fuel reduction things. They did what all the research tells us to do. We had irregular edges. They were scattered across the landscape. We maintained our canopy cover, our large trees, all of those things that the research tells us you know, are important for the various individual species that we're concerned about. This was in roughly 2009. I think this project took about three years to put together. Um, this is an overview of the rim fire, which people have probably seen before. In 2013, 257,000 acres. Uh, the vast majority of it was burned at fairly high severity. I thought about putting kind of reference bars and a scale on there, but it's, it's somewhat ludicrous. Um, you're talking about a, a spatial orders of magnitude greater. The natural disturbances and events that are occurring right now so vastly outpace our ability um, as managers to, to, to try to, to affect these things. Um, and then on top of this, if anybody's familiar with what's been going on in the Southern Sierras lately, 2014, the conifers started dying from a combination of climate change, drought, bark beetles, kind of pick whichever blame you want to give. But the bottom line is, um, the bottom line is that my opinion after 20 some years trying to do this is that yes, forest restoration is certainly possible in Western forests. And again, I look at it from the, through the lens of wildlife habitat. I do believe it's certainly possible, but not under our current uh, management and regulatory framework. There's just too many big discrepancies going on. Um, and I have to take responsibility for some of it. Like I said, I was deeply involved in those fuel reduction treatments, and then they just get completely swamped uh, by what nature really wants to do. So I'm going to talk about two projects, give you some examples as to why I've kind of come to this conclusion. Um, 
as I said, for about 11 years, we ran a pretty intensive Fisher uh, monitoring project in the Southern Sierras. Fishers, like I said, they've been on and off the endangered species list. They've kind of replaced spotted owls in the western states as the, the flagship for forestry and, and controversy in that area. Um, anybody that doesn't know anything about a fisher, essentially it's a, a tree-going weasel about the size of a house cat. Um, historically, they were distributed up and down California, and now they're relegated to a couple of um, native pop small native populations and one introduced population in the central Sierras. And so the Forest Service was interested in getting basic ecological information on fishers and understanding how they responded not only to management but also to forest heterogeneity in general. Um, the idea being that if we understood how they responded to natural variability on the landscape, maybe we could design some management that would better mimic that, that type of, of situation. And so for 11 years, we, we threw the kitchen sink at these animals. Um, we trapped them, we collared them, we tracked them on the ground with radio telemetry. We had a plane, and we tracked them five days a week for nine years from the air. Um, we used remote cameras, we had scat detector dogs doing non-invasive genetic surveys, we climbed den trees. Um, it's really not an exaggeration to say that a fisher couldn't really sneeze in this part of the landscape without my having a technician there to kind of mark the day and time. Um, we collected a tremendous amount of information, several of which, some of which has gone to graduate students here at, at USU, I have to say. Um, but one of the things that the Forest Service was particularly interested in these animals was their use of den trees. Um, fishers are obligate tree cavity Denners. They give birth in the dens. They raise their young in these tree cavities. Um, and they like, they're not too particular about the species, but they are very particular about the cavity that they use. And there was some thought that um, these might be limiting features on the landscape. And so might be one of the reasons, given past history of, of forest management, to get rid of all of these dead and dying old trees. Um, this might be one of the reasons that they've become somewhat rare. And the way that the Sierra National Forest plan and several forests in that area, the way the plans were written, and those forest plans are essentially law for the, the district biologists, the local folks, they, they have to follow these plans. Um, the way the plans were written there, every fisher den that was found received a 700 acre buffer. Um, at the time when they wrote that plan, they had found five dens in the Southern Sierras entirely. And so in 2007, when we started trapping um, of our first cohort of animals that we caught, we had 12 females, uh, or 12 adult females that subsequently denned. And so these were the buffers that were put on the landscape uh, for those animals. A couple of the things that we very quickly discovered about fishers is one, they don't use just one den the entire, during a season they'll actually move and they'll use anywhere from three to six dens in a year. And so the way the regulations were written, every one of those dens got a buffer as well. Um, so that would be the first year's worth of buffer. And then the next thing that we discovered about fishers is that they don't use the same dens year after year either. Um, sometimes they do, but more often than not, they will actually pick a new set of dens. Um, and so, it really wasn't very long before we had pretty much the mid-conifer belt of our study area, which was about 20% of the Sierra National Forest, locked up in these buffers. Um, and the way, again, the way the regulations were written, these were in perpetuity. These were permanent as far as the uh, forest bios were concerned, whether or not there was an animal at these sites, kind of like the spotted owl um, nest sites. And so, Another kind of useful piece of information about Fisher is their highest quality habitat is a fire ecologist's nightmare. Um, they like these big, dense trees. They like uh, dense areas of small diameter trees, a lot of understory, otherwise known as ladder fuels, um, and, and tree canopy. Again, really dense tree canopy, over 60 to 70 percent, again, otherwise known as crown fuels, as far as the fire ecologists are concerned. So. 
we all recognized that this was very much a non-sustainable situation. We had managed, through the way the regulations were written, to lock up pretty much this huge band of the Sierra National Forest, um, and fuels were just continuing to accumulate because no management at all was going to be allowed in these buffers. Um, and so, yeah, we all recognized that this was, was not a sustainable situation. And so we spent about five years putting together a conservation strategy. Um, this, this strategy was a joint forest service and conservation biology institute, a nonprofit group um, publication. It was based on, as I said, a tremendous amount of field data, both from our study and others. We tried to be, we incorporated as much science as we could get a hold of in this. We did habitat connectivity models. We did denning models. Um, we looked at prey. Basically, we tried to create a habitat accounting system that would recognize, so, so each of those hexagons on that map um, was approximately the size of a female home range. And we recognized that on any given year, there should be a certain number of suitable home ranges available on the landscape. But given forest dynamics, that was going to change in space and time. Um, so we wanted to give the managers on the ground flexibility to try to achieve their fuel reduction goals um, and not necessarily run afoul um, of fisher conservation guidelines, particularly if they got listed. Uh, we, we created a whole set of computerized decision support tools for these managers in order to um, predict the impacts of their different plans and their different prescriptions. How can they prescribe fuel reduction on the ground that does not influence habitat quality? Um, and cumulative effects. We tried to work across all the ownership boundaries for this entire region, um, improve the way that the, the, the district folks could do their cumulative effects analyses. Um, so essentially, we tried to put together this whole package deal, as much science as we could. Um, this was released, I think, in 2000 and, and first version in 15, then in 2016. It, it has yet to be very, it's been tried in a few places, but it hasn't really been implemented at all. And the reason it hasn't been implemented are, there are several of them. Um, for one part, it is complicated, and it's, very difficult for the district level folks to acquire the information, do the analyses, and necessarily push it forward without help. Um, and there are a lot of disincentives in the agency world for them to be creative and them to try to, to push things forward. Um, a lot of the agencies have very set ways of doing things, and it's far easier for the, the folks on the ground to just follow those and not try to think creatively or try to do anything new. Um, the other reason that it hasn't really been implemented is, as I mentioned, in, in fall of 2014, trees started dying in the Southern Sierras. Um, over the next three years, we lost close to 130 million trees, over 9 million acres. Um, many areas, it's, it's over 80% mortality for the conifers. I've got a, a series of maps here just kind of to show how it progressed. Um, as I said, it really started, it started in the fall of 2014, and the mortality was a consequence, combination of a prolonged drought and then bark beetles really starting to get going. And so by 2015, we saw a bit of it. By 2016, I've been told the bark beetles were up to four breeding cycles per year, and it was really starting to roll. And then by 2017, I think the beetles were up to, to five breeding seasons per year. Um, and this is when just massive amounts of conifers started dying. So uh, losing our canopy, losing a lot of our, our large trees, and primarily it was the large conifers that would go first. Um, and so my point with this entire description is that we put a ton of work into the science, we put a ton of work into the conservation strategy, um, and, and we're still getting the rug pulled out from under us, um, the way this goes. And nothing that we were doing, we, we thought that we were operating at an, at least an improved spatial and temporal scale with the conservation strategy that we put together. But it was absolutely nothing compared to what kind of nature had in store for us over the next few years. So the next example that I'm going to talk about is some work that I'm currently involved with, um, a project called the Blackfoot Swan Landscape Restoration Project up in northern Montana. 
Uh, it's about 250,000 acres of the Swan Valley. I don't know if anyone's ever seen the Swan Valley up there. It's, it's an absolutely beautiful landscape. Um, it is pretty much the epitome of what you think of when you think of kind of Montana mountainous land. Um, and the, the critter that, that drives it, drives my world, and drives the vast majority of the forest management practice up there is the lynx. Um, this has been a very controversial topic for a long time. Um, but pretty much all of the forest managers that try to get anything done on the ground, they have to deal with the regulations around lynx management. And so my part of this project essentially is um, trying to reconcile, again, large-scale large habitat restoration with lynx uh, requirements, ecological needs. And the Swan Valley is kind of an, an interesting landscape, and in it's, it's somewhat schizophrenic. You can't, I don't know if you can really see it on the, the aerial photo there, but the lower elevations, well, the, the two primary drivers of that landscape over time have been fire suppression and timber production. And the timber production all occurred on the lower elevation lands, the valley bottom and, and the foothill areas, areas. And in that part of the, part of the valley is, is highly fragmented. Um, a lot of past management projects leave areas, riparian areas, clear cuts, take your pick. Um, they created a ton of fragmentation in the valley bottom. But as you move up the slopes a little bit toward the higher elevation, those are the areas where fire suppression has had a much greater impact. And in those areas, we actually have an, a, a homogenization of the forest into this, these large patches of kind of a young multi-story multi spruce fir type environment. Um, let's see. And so our goal is to up there, and when I say our, it's, I'm not the only one. Um, I'm the wildlife person, but there's fire ecologists involved, there's vegetation and aquatic ecologists involved as well. Our goal is to come up with a, a large-scale, long-term restoration plan for this environment. And there's a lot of different ways out there in the literature that you can choose to do this. We chose to follow a process that's kind of been championed by Paul Hesburgh and some others through the Pacific Northwest Research Station, process using aerial photographs, both historic and current. And so the, in a nutshell, you basically do aerial photo interpretation of a set of historic photos compared to a set of current photos. Um, these are just some examples of the type of data that we create from that. From the direct interpretation, you get things like species composition, stand age, structural condition, heterogeneity, stuff like that. Conduct a lot of spatial analyses on these, things like diversity, contagion, patch size, large patch index, all those types of metrics. And then from all of that data, we turn around and we model a variety of landscape concerns, um, fire movement potential, um, endangered or focal species habitat, aquatic and road in interactions, things like that. And so you generate an absolute ton of information about this landscape, and you look for areas where it has changed over time. Uh, where are the indicators? We call them, Dr. Hesper calls them the departures in this landscape. Um, which things have been altered dramatically as a consequence of our management choices, and then you try to come up with prescriptions or management objectives and goals that can kind of start to push it back in the direction that you want it to go. And far and away, our biggest obstacle up there, obviously, is the lynx. Um, I will apologize to any foresters or silviculturists in the audience, because this is an extraordinarily simplified little forest succession diagram. Um, but it's from a lynx perspective, so give me a little, a little room there. Um, lynx are an interesting species in that they're kind of a great poster child for the need to restore uh, dynamic systems out there. And the reason is, one, they're very highly tied to their primary prey, which is snowshoe hare. And snowshoe hare, in turn, are very tightly tied to two of these age structures on the landscape. Um, in the summertime, the lynx den and hunt in the mature multi-story area. I guess I have a pointer, I could use that. Yeah, so they, they den in that area, but come wintertime, the snowshoe hares are found in much greater abundance in this younger, the stand initiation. And the stand initiation has a, a lifetime. There's, a, there's an expiration date on that habitat. Um, it's good for the rabbits from about when, about, at about 10 years, the conifers start to stick above the snow line. Um, and at that point, it's useful for the, the hares for cover and forage. And after about 40 years, though, those conifers are too tall. 
and the lower limbs on those trees are no longer accessible to the snowshoe hare in the wintertime. So, you know, you just picture a snowshoe hare on its hind legs trying to reach up to lower limbs. That's about your threshold. Beyond that, once the stand ages past that, gets down into some stem exclusion format, it, it's no longer useful to those animals. And so lynx depend on a dynamic natural disturbance process in order to keep this cycle in motion. If you kill that, that, that natural process of disturbance, gradually your whole landscape will kind of move this direction. Um, you lose the, the winter foraging habitat and you start to get overstocked in the multi-story stuff. And then the other thing to consider for lynx is that the regulations around lynx habitat management are very clearly uh, spelled out in this um, Northern Rockies Lynx Management Direction. This was first written in 2007, last updated in 2013. And the bottom line is that these two things are pretty much hands off as far as forest managers are concerned. They're not allowed to reduce the quantity of those, those habitat types on the landscape, um, except in, in some very specific exceptions. And from that departure analysis that I referenced earlier, what we found is that um, over here, don't worry too much about what the axes, axes are. And the, the green bars on these are the historic range of variability. So that's our, our historic photos. That's our comparative landscape. The, the kind of brownish bar up there, we're also looking at potential future variability for that landscape given project, uh, climate projections. And the hash marks are the different watersheds in the study area that we're looking at. And so the bottom line is that we are very much overstocked in kind of this young multi-story and leading up to the mature multi-story category. The averages or the acreage on the landscape, percent land is, really, is not actually so bad, but what's really messed up is the, the spatial configuration of these patches on the landscape compared to what is historically out there. Um, and that spatial configuration becomes very important when you start to picture a female length setting up a home range, trying to defend it, trying to access both of these different types in different patch sizes and such, that configuration becomes very important to the wildlife. Um, and there's been some interesting work uh, by Andrew Larson and others up there looking at the, the natural, what maintained this cycle historically. And what it is, is a multi-disturbance um, system where, let's see, in order to, to simplify this whole process, and it kind of gets back to the ball and diagram, or ball and cup diagram that, that Dr. Brunson mentioned earlier, this young multi-story is a very unstable state. Um, it requires, it's going to either, it, it's going to go somewhere based on the disturbance regime. If the disturbances are fairly frequent in that environment, it's going to continue this cycle and it's going to, going to maintain the somewhat fine scale heterogeneity that the links are used to. If you allow that young forest multi-story to start to accumulate after a while, on the other hand, you go the other direction and you start getting these larger stand replacing wildfires, which may or may not necessarily be bad, but what's changing is the spatial configuration of all of this stuff on the landscape. Um, and that's kind of what we saw in 2000, last year. The Rice Ridge Fire up there burned over 150,000 acres of prime lynx habitat, probably the best lynx habitat in the lower 48. Um, and a lot of that burned at very high severity. Again, I'm not opposed to high severity fire. I don't even think the volume is necessarily bad on the landscape. But what bothers me as a wildlife ecologist is the spatial configuration of these patches. A 150,000 acre patch of regenerating forest is no good for a lynx. They need that mix on the landscape. And so the patch size, the distribution, the patch density, things like that are critical. Luckily for us, um, there's been a lot of research coming out of, of several places, British Columbia and the Northern Rocky Mountain Research Station, looking at actually how lynx respond to that mosaic on the landscape. Um, some work by Megan Kosterman, all of these various graphs. She's looking at core areas up here for lynx, the, where they spend the majority of their time, the overall home range for them, how that landscape matrix relates to um, reproductive success, the connectivity of the different patches, things like that. And, and so for me, as a landscape wildly, wildlife ecologist, this type of information is critical in order to try to inform management decisions on the ground. Um, and so, come back kind of full circle back to this whole large scale restoration project. 
We're putting together a plan for 250,000 acres. It's going to be released to the public for comment in about a month. Um, we know we're going to get sued. It's just, I mean, there's no question about it. We're violating too many of the, the legal precedents of the environmental standards. But what we're trying to do is build a very solid scientific foundation that when we do get sued, at least for the judge or for the public or whoever else wants to look at it, um, we can actually push the stakeholders and push the agencies in the direction of thinking bigger on the landscape. Because, um, I mean, personally, I think that, that that is absolutely the way that the agencies need to go. So I could have pulled examples from a variety of different carnivores that I've worked with over the years, or non-carnivores. Anybody that knows anything about water, Hoelia, that's actually a really cool little plant. Um, all of these species are dependent on ecosystem dynamics in one way or another, and yet all of our regulations are written very specific to individual places on the landscape to protect, things like that. Um, I could have used a variety of them. But, but basically, the story is all the same. Um, after 20-some years kind of working in this field and, and dealing with these types of conflicts, um, I strongly believe that we have to, have to pull back and take a bigger picture on a lot of these regulations and manage, management objectives. Um, looks like I am out of time. So I will end with one kind of plea, actually. After, again, 20 years of being both sides of the research and the management um, I'll, to any researchers or graduate students who are going to become researchers out there, if we are going to restore western forests and restore the functionality, I think it is absolutely critical that researchers get somewhat out of your comfort zone, and you need to find those managers that are trying to implement the new science, and you need to help them, because they definitely have an uphill battle for what they're trying to do. So with that, thank you, and I'll take any questions. All right, we have about five minutes for questions. And just as a reminder, if you don't get your question answered, we will have an extended break in which um, you can ask these questions to all of this morning, uh, this morning's speakers. Oh, over there, yeah. Uh, there were about seven questions, <laughs> I mean, or I could have about seven answers. Um, the fires are, as they get bigger and broader, we've had a lot of population fragmentation. Uh, say, there's just literally things being isolated. Um, that is a huge issue. Um, the tree mortality is an ongoing um, problem. We actually don't have fissures collared right now. Those projects ended in 2017. However, last month, a judge put them back on the endangered species candidate list, so now it's going to, we don't know if we're going to be putting them back on or not. Um, with the tree mortality, fishers are very thermally regulated. This is the southern end of their, their distribution. Um, and for at least a couple of years after a conifer dies, it still has its needles. And so it is still altering the landscape for a while. Um, the animals are still there. They are still using this this dying landscape. Um, I, anyone who happened to attend Jenny Kordowski's master's defense last Thursday, she could tell you that their stress levels are through the roof um, because we've been meshing cortisol and hair and trying to determine what the drivers of that. And tree mortality is a huge driver of that. And so what the long-term consequences of that are, we don't know. Um, there's a lot of research out there that that does have survival and reproductive um, impacts. We don't know if they're still on the landscape out of habit because they are territorial and they know this area. Um, they may not have anywhere else to go. Um, so there's, there's a whole lot kind of packed into that. But yes, we're still trying to, to monitor them and find out. I think there was, yeah? So single species management policy by the agencies, good or not so good? I'm not a fan anymore. I, I started out, you know, I'm, I'm a big fan. I, I don't want to advocate for, for, for irresponsible change or anything, but I've, and I've spent a lot of time arguing single species needs, and yet I've, I've watched, as I put that little cartoon up there, I've watched the rug get pulled out from under it over and over again. Um, and so I think the need to step back and think bigger about what we're doing is critical. All right, I think we have time for one more question. Okay. 
showed the differences as far as the needs for the uh, for the species, the, the wildlife species versus fuels management. Mm -hmm. Uh, what was the question? I view Fisher kind of, I, I picture them as my kids in a candy store. Um, they love this dense overgrown forest. It's not what they would have had historically. Um, and all of the research that we have done on fishers is in fire suppressed forest. So we're biased right off the bat in terms of where do we find the animal? Oh, it's in a fire suppressed forest. It's in a dense forest. They must need this. Um, they do need this. Do they need it? It's like my kids in a candy store. They love this dense landscape, but it's not necessarily the healthiest thing for them because does a fire get started, you lose the entire thing. Um, historically, there was a lot more variability on the landscape out there. Um, I don't know sage grouse at all, but I do know with fishers, the more we look, the more adaptable they appear to be. Um, I think oftentimes, at least with these forest carnivores, we don't give them enough credit um, for their ability to work in other environments. Um, historically, they had to work in these other environments. So, again, I can't speak for sage grouse because I don't know that environment, but with fishers, I think um, we definitely have a risk of over-interpreting the research that's done in fire suppressed um, environments and not recognizing their ability to function in other areas as well. That helps. All right. Thank you.